The Oceanography class, this is chapter two, plate tectonics and the ocean floor. So plate, well, the theory of plate tectonics kind of came about um, in the late 50s and 1960s, but there was a guy, uh, Alfred Wegener, who first proposed uh, a hypothesis called continental drift. There he is, smoking his pipe, and this was in 1912, so a good 40 years ahead of uh, the current theory of plate tectonics. Fun fact, in 1912, uh, Woodrow Wilson was our president, it was a long time ago, and the Republic of China was founded in 1912. I bet you didn't know that. Okay, so continental drift, essentially what, what uh, Alfred Wegener was saying way before his time um, he was a German meteorologist, by the way. He wasn't even a, a geologist. But he proposed that in Earth's past, there once existed one large continent called Pangaea. That's what he called it. Um, and it existed about 200 million years ago. And what that created is if you had all the land masses kind of grouped together, like you see here, this would be Pangaea. This would make it an incredibly large ocean, larger <laughs> than the uh, Pacific Ocean is today, which is incredible. Um, this here would be the Tethys Sea 200 million years ago. Um, and one of his major lines of evidence, and I'm sure you've done this at some point, like looking at a globe, is that he noted that a lot of the modern continents look like they fit together like puzzle pieces. So if you look at the um, eastern coast of South America and West Africa, they look like they could fit together. So I think that's what kind of seeded the initial idea. So here's that puzzle-like fit I've been talking about. Uh, South America and Africa kind of fit together. Um, you can put uh, Northern Europe, Greenland, uh, in with the Northeast of the Americas. Um, and later on in the 60s, uh, another scientist, Sir Edward Bullard, um, he used computer models to uh, best fit the continents together. And if you see this black outline, this is uh, the shallow portion at the edge of the continents. They're called the um, continental shelves. And if you include the continental shelves, not just the coastlines, the fit was about like 92%. So uh, it's a good line of evidence for movement of our uh, major land masses. The next line of evidence that um, Alfred Wegener used to support his continental drift hypothesis was um, matching sequences of rocks and mountain chains on these different major land masses and continents. Okay, what he found were there were similar rock types, let's say in uh, eastern North America, Greenland, uh, in places in Europe and also in North Africa. They had similar rock types, their ages were very similar, and the structures to those rocks um, were very similar as well. And what we know about major um, mountain chains today, modern mountain chains and younger mountain chains, uh, is that they're very continuous. Think of South America, uh, the Andes kind of run from uh, Colombia and Ecuador all the way down to the tip of Chile. Uh, and that's a young mountain chain. The Appalachian Mountains are very old, okay? Uh, so segments of it seem to have been ripped off and kind of left behind in, on different continents. So that was another line of evidence. Another uh, major line of evidence uh, were, was, was looking at ancient climates. Um, he took a look at uh, some uh, really old rocks that were, you know, over 200 million years old. And what he found was there was evidence of glaciation in areas that today are tropical. And glaciers, just to get an idea, they're just basically giant ice rivers, and they kind of carve their way uh, down mountain ranges through valleys and sometimes into the ocean, uh, other times just kind of out onto the land. And they're tremendously heavy, and so they scour the bedrock, and they leave these markings called striations, and they leave really big deposits. So, you know, over the course of millions of years, um, the, the, that evidence uh, of glaciers remains, and we can make uh, assumptions about the environment in Earth's past based on the, those lines of evidence. 
And so what he found was in rocks that aged back to Pangaea times over 200 million years ago, there were glaciers uh, in India, in um, uh, south and into central Africa. Uh, this is really close to the equator, guys. The, the Congo has a uh, rainforest essentially here. Uh, in South America, which could possibly be believable because this is so far south uh, in Australia. But this, um, all these these cases of uh, continental glaciers advancing in these areas don't really make sense uh, given their current position. And so, um, what he what he suggested perhaps is that maybe the continents uh, he moved the continents. Uh, two latitudes that are more appropriate for glaciers to form. Okay, so uh, this right here. So he moved India and Australia further south into the Southern Pole, connected South America and Africa, and lo and behold, this whole area uh, makes sense for glaciers to be advancing. Okay. Um, in addition to uh, the climate evidence, um, he also collected a lot of plant and animal fossils, and that's very important too because plants and animals only live in certain environments, right? So if you take a look at some of the fossil evidence, uh, one fossil here, this was a, um, a dinosaur, uh, but it was only lived in freshwater, okay? And you find this fossil of this organism in both South America and in Africa. It's kind of like, uh, we'll say like a modern day alligator, but a, a dinosaur. So it was a freshwater reptile. Now, how is it possible if, if, if the continents were fixed in their locations, um, which at, in 1912, everybody believed that to be true? Like without a doubt, nobody questioned it. And it, you know, I don't blame them. I mean, do you feel like you're moving westward a few centimeters a year? No, it's so slow, it's really imperceptible. But the question here is, these fossils that are over 200 million years old are found, the exact same species are found in two different continents. And think about that. Think about the different organisms that exist today in South America versus Africa, right? Do you find giraffes in South America? No, you don't, right? You find... Um, uh, llamas in Africa? No. So uh, what happens is when, when organisms are separated by major oceans, there tends to be kind of like a diversification uh, of those organisms and, and, and their differences become great. So how is it possible that uh, the same exact species existed in two continents that were separated by an entire ocean? Um, and this really perplexed a lot of pa paleontologists for a long time. They thought perhaps that um, there might have been a bunch of islands in between Africa and South America that they like colonized uh, and then made it to South America, which isn't true. They thought perhaps uh, sea level was lower, exposing a land bridge that connected the two land masses. Um, uh, that is also not true. Since we started mapping the ocean floor, there's no uh, you know, land bridges, kind of like the Bering Strait and Alaska and Russia. That's not the case. Some even hypothesize that perhaps uh, this organism drifted on some flotsam or flow driftwood and made it across the thousands of, of uh, kilometers across the Atlantic Ocean and then just to colonize one of the continents, either from South America or from Africa. Uh, that seems very far-fetched for a freshwater organism to make it a uh, kind of months-long journey uh, through the ocean. Uh, to make it to a different landmass. So what Alfred Wegener suggested is that this was actually one landmass. South America and Africa were connected, and they were one landmass. And this organism existed in that one landmass in an area that encompasses this here. So these landmasses were connected. It lived, it died, it became part of the fossil record, and slowly the continents began to drift apart. And that was his explanation uh, for that problem. So he published a book called The or Origins of Continents and Oceans, um, where he explains his continental drift hypothesis. 
Now, where, where Alfred Wegener kind of run into to issues was um, he suggested that the continents kind of plow through the ocean basins, kind of like how ships um, uh, kind of break through sea ice in that fashion. And so he was really met with open ridicule and criticism. And his only uh, uh, you know, mechanism to explain how the continents move was through gravitational attractions from the moon and sun. Physicists kind of came out and mathematically proved him wrong almost instantaneously, and he was kind of just laughed out of the room and kind of shunned by uh, most scientists at the time. Um, and so his proposed mechanism really defied the laws of physics, and uh, it didn't stick, that his hypothesis didn't stick because it fell apart once it was tested. But the observations remained uh, very true, and it still presented uh, a big problem for scientists to think about for you know the next 40 years. Um, and then post-World War II, uh, the United States Navy was equipped with all this new technology, right? Developed a lot of new technology to find like German submarines and boats and stuff like that. So wartime was over and so they decided, hey, perhaps let's use this to map the ocean floor. Let's use new technologies like sonar. Um, other new technology enabled uh, us to understand uh, our Earth's magnetic field. So we started exploring and understanding a little more and so our Earth has a magnetic field, and it works a lot like uh, a, a dipole uh, magnet in the sense that there's, um, there's magnetic polarity, there's a north pole, and there's a south pole. Okay? And what happens is these magnetic field lines kind of come in towards the north pole, uh, and then they come out towards the south pole. And the magnetic field is very important very important for life on our planet because it blocks a lot of the uh, solar wind and harmful radiation from striking the earth. Um, and uh, what we should all also notice is that the uh, this here, this white line, is the geographic north pole. So this is the axis that goes through the sphere of our earth. And that kind of goes through right through the center. Okay, The magnetic north pole is not in the same location. Okay, so that's right over here currently, right here, the magnetic north pole. So there's a difference between the magnetic north pole and our actual, actual geographic north pole. And the cool thing about our uh, uh, paleomagnetism or, or our magnetic field is that um, when volcanic rocks erupt on the Earth's surface, so when there's a volcano and it erupts, and that material slowly cools down and solidifies into a rock. There are tiny little minerals inside those volcanic rocks that have a lot of iron in them. And specifically, a mineral called magnetite has a lot of iron in it. And um, it's uh, magnetic. So it interacts with our magnetic field. And it'll actually kind of move like a, like a needle in a compass. And it'll point towards magnetic north. So wherever there's a volcanic eruption on the Earth's surface, that lava will record the current magnetic conditions on Earth. So if we're at Hawaii today and there's a lava flow, that'll record the current magnetic conditions uh, on Earth today. If there was a, a, an eruption in Africa 200 million years ago, that uh, eruption and lava would record the magnetic information of our Earth 200 million years ago. So that was that's really cool and important because then we could start to construct kind of like a history of how our magnetic field has changed and altered through uh, geologic time. And that led to the study of uh, paleomagnetism. Okay, so. It's a way of studying uh, the Earth's ancient magnetic fields. Okay, so it also helps us interpret rocks' first form. It gives us an idea. The reason why is because, check this out. Here's the geographic North Pole again. Okay, here's the magnetic North Pole. So think of um, these dip needles as magnetite minerals. 
that are pointing towards your magnetic north pole. So if you have um, if you have uh, an, a volcanic eruption, right? Let's say we got a volcano, volcanic eruption, and then there's a volcanic rock that cools down and crystallizes. All the magnetite grains will point in this direction, and so we can calculate that angle and then figure out the latitude where that eruption was in, how, in Earth's past. So it's a way of uh, finding out or interpreting where certain volcanic rocks have formed in the Earth's past. Okay, and that's by measuring the magnetic dip. If you had a volcanic eruption closer to the magnetic north pole, the um, magnetite minerals will point straight down. And if you had one kind of in the southern hemisphere, they'd kind of point outwards like this. So uh, that's a pretty cool way of understanding or pin, kind of pinpointing uh, the latitude of where uh, ancient volcanic rocks may have erupted on the Earth's surface. Okay. In addition to that, um, our magnetic uh, north pole shifts and moves, which is pretty crazy. Google Maps has to update uh, the shifting magnetic poles um, almost every year because it does move sig significantly enough to affect people's kind of traveling uh, to different areas using uh, GPS uh, measurements. But here is the, uh, the the changing magnetic north pole since 1831 to about 2015. Okay, and then here's the geographic north pole over here. That's what goes through the center of our Earth. Okay, so this is in the northern hemisphere. So over the course of um, 150 years, uh, our magnetic north pole has moved uh, very a very large distance. Okay, and even crazier than this we have what we refer to as magnetic polarity reversals, okay? What that means is the North Pole becomes the South Pole and the South Pole becomes the North Pole. <laughs> what? <laughs> so what happens, and on average it happens about every 5,000 years, so it hasn't really happened since um, we've been aware of uh, this, but these reversals are recorded in volcanic rocks. That's how we know they happen, and that's how we can come up with the average. Um, but essentially, so you have your Earth. Here's the North Pole, right? Oh, God, I can't even draw an N. Okay, and then here's the South Pole. All right, then there's a switch, okay? And now this is this, this becomes the new South Pole, and down in the Southern Hemisphere becomes the North Pole, okay? This, the switch isn't instantaneous. They think there's a couple hundred years of a, of a shifting pole, like... The North Pole will shift towards the equator and hang around and move a little bit here before it does the, uh, the entire shift, um, the entire kind of reversal. Uh, but this happens, and this has happened thousands of times in geologic past. Okay, so the, the polar wandering, uh, now, uh, as, as after World War II, scientists started noticing a lot of different kind of uh, interesting things once they started recording or finding out what the Earth's uh, magnetic fields were like in the past. Um, what they what they noticed that the North Pole actually moves over time, right? And I showed you that it moves over the past 150 million years. The North the magnetic North Pole has moved quite a distance. But what about in geologic time, hundreds of millions of years? So what happened is a bunch of scientists started plotting the location of the magnetic North Pole from uh, volcanic rocks at different ages, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, 300, all the way up to 500 million years ago. Okay, so this black line represents the locations of the magnetic north pole based on volcanic rocks in Eurasia, so Europe and Asia. So this is where the magnetic north pole was in the past based on the continent of Europe and Asia. Okay, from rocks that were collected there. This is assuming that the continents don't move. So then other scientists did the same comparison and plotted similarly aged volcanic rocks, 100 million year old uh, volcanic rocks, 200, 300, 400, and 500 from North America. And they plotted in different locations. So these are the same age. So what this indicates is, wait a minute, there's two North Poles, two magnetic North Poles? And that's impossible. That's not possible. And again, the 200 million year old um, 
uh, volcanic rocks from different parts of the world plot in two different areas. So there's something wrong there, right? And so what the scientists realized is that the continents aren't fixed. They must have moved. And when you adjust uh, over time for the movement of the continents, then the data of uh, polar wandering matches up a lot better. And these were the actual locations uh, throughout the past 500 million years of where the uh, ge the uh, magnetic North Pole was. So polar wandering was a great line of evidence to support the now new theory of plate tectonics. So um, in 1955, uh, a, a lot of scientists were going on expeditions on boats, and they started to record the uh, magnetic features of the volcanic rocks they found on the ocean floor. And they found these uh, kind of crazy magnetic anomalies. So they found this kind of regular kind of barcode pattern, north-south uh, stripes or magne magnetized stripes in uh, volcanic rocks. And they were very symmetrical, okay? Um, and so what the boats did is they dragged kind of a, a magnetometer behind the boat and uh, it would measure the Earth's magnetic field and how it was affected by the seafloor rocks. And so uh, Harry Hess was uh, uh, one of the first geologists. Um, he was a submarine captain, and he was one of the first to kind of uncover the idea that the sea floor is moving and it's spreading open. Okay, so he collected depth recordings showing the seafloor features, and they found a lot of really interesting features on the seafloor. I mean, up until this point, we knew more about the surface of the moon than we did about the uh, seafloor and all its its topology and ridges and mountains that you found and can canyons that you find down there. Um, so once we had the technology to kind of map the ocean floor, we started mapping it. And most people thought it was just a flat nothingness where a lot of sediment goes to deposit. But they actually found mountain ranges and valleys and volcanic features. And um, So yeah. So then uh, this discovery, understanding that the seafloor actually moves, helped uncover the history and the birth of oceans and ocean basins, meaning like how do ocean lower parts of the ocean kind of form over time. Okay, and the real driving mechanism that helps explain uh, the motion of tectonic plates and the seafloor is uh, movement in the mantle. Okay, this is what Alfred Wegener couldn't really explain. Um, there are convection cells that form deep in the mantle. Okay, so there's this is a convection cell. So hot mantle rises, becomes less dense, and as it rises, it cools becomes more dense and that completes a convection cell. And that movement in the mantle is what drives and pushes ocean plates, okay? So here's a mid-ocean ridge. These are those mountains that Harry Hess found as they mapped the ocean floor. And what they realized is that the center of these mid-ocean ridges spread open. They move in this direction, okay? And essentially, this is what drives plate tectonics. And as two plates collide, sometimes plates sink. Other plates kind of stay above, or a little more buoyant. Okay, and so here's the idea of seafloor spreading. Here comes a uh, upwelling mantle. You have two plates moving in the opposite direction, and essentially it's spreading open, and new volcanism occurs at the bottom of the ocean here, and new ocean plates are created as these plates move away from each other. Okay. And the reason why uh, they figured this out is because um, they started mapping these new areas of the ocean floor, and they gave it a name called the Mid-Ocean Ridge because essentially it's just a mountain. They found mountains at the bottom of the ocean, and they were like, what is this? This looks like a ridge. Okay, we'll call it a Mid-Ocean Ridge. And essentially, this is where the spreading is occurring. Okay. In other areas where you have two tectonic plates kind of colliding with each other, we refer to those as subduction zones. Okay, this is uh, a site where there's actual tectonic crust destruction. Um, and then uh, we also find in these zones, in subduction zones, um, we find the deepest parts of the oceans, like the Marianas Trench, 
uh, is an ocean is an ocean trance as a result of subduction and two plates colliding. Okay, so two scientists uh, in the early 60s, Frederick Vine and Drummond Matthews, really produced the smoking gun to um, kind of prove uh, the seafloor spreading hypothesis, or uh, ultimately the huge paradigm shift in the plate tectonics theory kind of coming up during this time. And so what they did was they analyzed igneous rocks uh, at a mid-ocean ridge. And there's a mid-ocean ridge off the co west coast of the United States right here. Okay, here's the axis of that mid-ocean ridge. And then they con collected, they towed a magnetometer at the edge of the boat, they mapped the ocean floor, and they towed this right behind it and collected all the magnetic data for the volcanic rocks that you find on the ocean floor. And what they found was these, what they refer to as seafloor stripes. If you look at either side of this mid-ocean ridge, um, this side and this, this side are perfectly symmetrical, okay? So for example, um, the, here's the ridge axis, right? Um, this is where volcanism is occurring, okay? So there's some volcanoes and eruptions and stuff like that. And so this is where new igneous rocks are forming. And the new igneous rocks that form record the current uh, magnetic conditions on Earth. So as you move away from the ridge, all of a sudden there's a shift in the magnetic properties of the volcanic rocks, meaning that there was a polarity reversal. And on the other side, you see that same shift again. And then you go from normal to reverse polarity to normal to reverse to normal to reverse. And the exact same thing occurs on the other side of the ridge axis. And so what that indicates is that over time, if you start from step one to step two to step three, these ocean plates are moving away from each other. And as they move away from each other, magma is coming up from the mantle and solidifying and erupting, uh, mostly solidifying, becoming part of the two ocean plates moving away from each other. But some of that volcanic material erupts on the bottom of the ocean floor. And when it does so, it records the current polarity conditions, right? And so this is a continual process. And over time, uh, let's say there's a, a change in the polarity, like the poles switch, north is south and south is north. All the new volcanic activity, all those new igneous rocks that form will record the new polarity conditions. So we went from normal here to reverse here and reverse here and normal here. Okay, so you can imagine that this is kind of spreading open. Okay, and as this process continues, say there's another polarity reversal, another polarity reversal. So all the new igneous rocks that are forming at these mid-ocean ridges now reflect normal polarity. And this is reverse and this is normal. So you see it kind of has like a, a, a barcode type pattern and you can imagine that this is spreading apart. Think of it as gross as this sounds. Think of um, seafloor spreading as like, let's say you fell off your bike or skateboard um, and you have a scab on your knee. If you spread that scab open, blood will come out, right? And that blood becomes part of the scab. So think of magma as like earth blood and as it comes out, it becomes part of the ocean plate, which is the scab. <laughs> I know that's pretty gross, but it kind of, it works. Um, in addition to that, um, scientists at that time, late 50s, early 60s, made huge advances in being able to uh, age date volcanic rocks. Um, and so uh, there was a, a huge te technological advances as well as uh, in drilling and drilling on ships. So uh, we could go out with ships and then uh, essentially collect sediment and drill down into um, the ocean crust. Okay. So we started dating all the ocean rocks. And so what we realized is that that symmetric pattern um, of, the, uh, uh, of the magnetic polarity reversals also correlated really well with the age of those volcanic rocks. And what they found out was that the oldest ocean rocks were only about 180 million years old, which is a big disparity between rocks on land. Like they found the oldest rocks on land are about 3.8, 3.5 billion years old, but the oldest 
you know, uh, ocean crust was only 180 million years old. So it was a big discrepancy. And so they often, they kind of wondered, like, what was going on? Where did all the ocean crust go over the past four point, I mean, uh, 3.5 billion years? Okay, here's a map showing you the age of the ocean floor. So the youngest uh, rocks um, are between zero and two million years old. And what you notice, they're found right at the mid-ocean ridges, right at the center or at the axis of these spreading centers. So here's the mid-Atlantic ridge. Okay, so it goes right through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And these are the youngest rocks. And this is where that uh, spreading center is. And that makes sense, right? Because if we're at the ridge of the spreading center, that's where their new volcanism is occurring, and that's where new volcanic rocks are being produced. So they've got to be the youngest. And as these plates kind of spread apart over time, slowly, in this direction, they're kind of going in opposite directions, the rocks get progressively older. So as you go from here to, let's say, to yellow, yellow uh, indicates that they're, these volcanic rocks are 56 to 66 million years old. Okay, so if you go out here, these rocks 56 million years ago were found right at the mid-ocean ridge. Okay, so this was, th the age of the ocean floor really um, helped solidify the theory of plate tectonics or supported the idea that, you know, spreading centers are moving. Okay, a couple centimeters per year, but they are moving. Uh, another valuable piece of evidence that supports the theory of plate tectonics is uh, heat flow. You can measure the amount of heat that's coming off the Earth's crust. And what we notice is that it's very high at mid-ocean ridges, which makes sense because these are volca volcanically active areas. So there's a lot of heat that's being uh, radiated off uh, the ocean crust in these areas. And really what clinched everything and what gave us an idea uh, of the um, shape of tectonic plates are earthquakes. Earthquakes are uh, kind of like a, a propagation of energy through our earth and they occur because of uh, movement along these tectonic plates. So whenever there's a, a, a lot of slipping or movement along the tectonic plates, these plates kind of grind past each other and generate a lot of energy and those seismic waves kind of propagate through the Earth's crust. So a seismologist started plotting the, the epicenters of all the earthquakes that were occurring on a year yearly basis and they noticed some patterns. They noticed that if you plotted the epicenters of all the earthquakes on Earth, they essentially occur in these zones. And you can draw along this, and this essentially outlines the different tectonic plates. And they go right through all the different tectonic boundaries. See how they nicely line through the mid-Atlantic ridge? This is a, a spreading uh, center, mid-ocean ridge. Two plates are moving away from each other, and that generates earthquakes when they make those movements, as well as volcanism. And so when you plot this, you start to see that our Earth... Earth's surface is covered in these kind of tectonic boundaries. All right, and that's how we've been able to generate uh, an image like this. These are our global plate boundaries. So we're on the North American plate and we're moving kind of in a westward direction at a rate of about two, between 2.5 and 2.8 centimeters per year. Okay, the Pacific plate is kind of moving north, northwest. The Nazca plate is crashing into the South American plate. Okay, here's the Caribbean plate. It's got its own thing going, a smaller plate right here. The Australian, Antarctic, Eurasian, the Arabian plate, the African plate, and the Indian plate. So I think there are about 12 major tectonic plates. And then the colors here represent the different types of boundaries. Okay, and we'll talk about those boundaries. The first type, which we've kind of mentioned already, this is the seafloor spreading. This is a divergent plate, brown, plate boundary. This is where two tectonic plates, and I look like a child writing <laughs> seafloor, okay. Um, this is where two tectonic plates are moving away from each other. We call that a divergent plate boundary. When you have two plates kind of crashing into one another, we refer to that as convergent. And then the last type of plate boundary are where you have two plates kind of sliding past one another. That's called transform, a transform plate boundary. 
So I'm not going to go through this. This is a lot of information here, but this is for your reference. Okay. These are this is uh, the three different types of plate boundaries: transform, convergent, and divergent. So this is the diagram for each one of them. Okay. Uh, this is the different types of crust that uh, can interact with one another, creating these boundaries. Um, the tectonic process and the seafloor features that you run into. But we're going to end geographic examples of this. But we're going to go into detail in the other slides. So let's first talk about divergent plate boundaries. This is where two tectonic plates kind of move apart from each other. All right, you find these at mid-ocean ridges like we talked about before. Um, at the center of these mid-ocean ridges is what you typically find is a rift valley. And that valley is where you see those volcanic eruptions of a kind of new ocean crust being created. Okay, what we know about the earthquakes here is that they're very shallow, okay, meaning that they're not very deep within the earth. Okay, so the, the earthquakes are not very strong and they're very shallow. Um, and, and that's typical of uh, divergent plate boundary features. You can also find them um, on land as well, where you have a divergent plate boundary and essentially a continent is splitting apart. Okay. So here's a cross section of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay, so underneath it, you have one lithospheric plate here, another lithospheric plate here. Here's the asthenosphere. Um, as these two plates move apart from each other, a uh, hot mantle rises and then begins to melt. And then those melts become part of the two ocean lithosphere as they kind of move apart. And if you look, you zoom in a bit, this is the inner rift valley, low lying areas with really high ridges over here. And this is, again, at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so this is what blew a lot of scientists' minds away, is that not only when they were mapping the ocean floor, they found that it wasn't just flat, there were actually mountains like these ridges uh, that you find here. But on top of that, there's volcanism. And in fact, um, the majority of volcanism on the surface of our Earth is underneath our oceans at these mid-ocean ridges. Okay, so this is how a divergent boundary forms or can form, okay? So we have a uh, continental crust, okay? This is where you and me would live, you know? House, yay, nice house, woo, it looks like a barn, okay, again, draw houses. Um, and so what initially happens is you have upwarping and you have uh, incoming uh, upwelling mantle causes an initial upwarping. So this kind of raises an elevation and there's some volcanism associated with that. But then uh, the lithosphere kind of thins and then as a result of this begins to start moving in opposite directions. And then a rift valley forms, a low lying area here, which you'll see are volcanoes here. Um, and then over time, as uh, millions of years go by, um, the, land, the land here will get so low and the, the um, lithosphere so thin uh, that you'll have an invading narrow sea, such a low lying area that the ocean will come in and fill it in. And this is the birth of a new ocean basin, very linear sea here. And what you see start to develop in the middle of this new ocean basin is a mid-ocean ridge. And so that's how mid-ocean ridges form. So uh, a current example of this, uh, what's going on today is uh, in East Africa. If you look at East Africa, you see these red lines here, these are uh, divergent plate boundaries. So here, Yemen's kind of moving away from uh, mainland Africa, and there's a low-lying valley in here, and no surprise, there's active volcanism in these, this East African rift. So this portion of um, East Africa is rifting off of the continent of Africa. Eventually, uh, a narrow sea will form in between this, and this will become kind of Madagascar 2.0, okay? This has happened to Africa already. You see this, the Red Sea here. You see, notice that this is a narrow sea. The Arabian Peninsula was once connected to the African continent, but divergent plate boundary formed. You had continental rifting, and now a narrow sea has formed, and now there's a mid-ocean ridge right in here. Okay. So there's um, different types of spreading centers. It's essentially just based on their spreading rate, like how quickly do the uh, ocean plates move. Ocean rises 
are a type of mid-ocean ridge where you have really fast spreading. And what's typical of these um, is you have gentle slopes. I'll show you in the next slide uh, what they kind of look like on the ocean floor. But we find uh, an, a nice example of an ocean rise in the East Pacific. Okay, An ocean ridge is what was heavily studied in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, These are slower spreading, maybe two to three centimeters per year. Okay, excuse me. East Pacific, this one uh, can be anywhere between 15 and let's say 18 centimeters. Oof, centimeters per year, per year. Okay, um, and then in the the way it looks on on the ocean because it spreads slow so slowly, it creates these very steep slopes and ridges. That's why it gets that name, ocean ridge. And then there are really slow moving mid ocean ridges. And that creates a deep uh, rift valley in the center where the volcanism occurs. You have scattered volcanoes, and the examples of this are the Arctic, and in southwest India, there's some uh, mid-ocean ridges in the Indian Ocean there. Okay, so just to get an example, this is a uh, uh, ocean floor map of the East Pacific Rise. Okay, so that's out here in the Pacific Ocean. So here's South America; it's off the coast. Uh, way out in the middle of the, of the Pacific Ocean. You see that? This little lo line right here, that's that little bump or that uh, rise. Okay, And if you look at a cross-section, you notice the cross-section of the ocean floor, it's very hard to even see. It's a little bump up here, and that's the little rise. That's where the a lot of the uh, volcanism is occurring here, and new ocean crust is being created. So this plate is moving in this direction. So these are actual uh, maps of the ocean floor. So that's the divergence. So this is a fast moving spreading center, 15 to 17 centimeters a year. Okay. Now over here, this is what the ocean floor looks like at the mid-Atlantic Ridge. Notice uh, it looks mountainous, right? And so uh, if you look at a cross section of this, there's a lot of ridges. You see that ridges? And then right here at the center of it, there's a rift valley um, and then more ridges. Okay. And so essentially, this looks a lot, a lot more like a mountain. It's more jagged. There's uh, ridges, and then there's a central rift valley here. Uh, and the reason for this change in topology is basically because it spreads at a slower rate, two to three centimeters per year. So there are differences in the different types of spreading centers, and that uh, the difference is how fast they spread, and that results in uh, uh, different features of the ocean floor. All right, let's talk about convergent plate boundaries now. This is where two tectonic plates collide into one another. Okay, and here, this is where ocean crust is destroyed. Okay, and this is uh, what scientists finally figured out the reason why the ocean floor is so young. Right? Remember, it's the oldest ocean uh, crust is about 180 million years old, whereas continental crust can be as old as 3.8 billion. Well, what happens is ocean crust is often on a collision course with other tectonic plates. And as they collide, they sink into the earth. They sink into the mantle. And that creates an ocean trench right here. And then above the overriding plate, you'll have a volcanic arc. And I'll show you what that looks like. And the reason why we know this occurs and we can create models for this is when you plot the uh, three-dimensional locations of the earthquakes, um, the focus of the earthquake, meaning like where it is underground, they're very deep, right? They're very deep underground. And I'll show you what that kind of means in a second. Okay. So here, this is the model of a subduction zone or a convergent plate boundary. See, we have ocean lithosphere here. Okay. Here is continental lithosphere. And when these two uh, lithospheric plates collide, the ocean lithosphere will sink underneath the continental lithosphere. And the reason for this is because the ocean lithosphere is more dense than the continental lithosphere. It's heavier per unit volume. So when they collide, it actually sinks into the mantle and continues to sink because it's denser than the asthenosphere. And the reason why we know this happened is if you um, plot the earthquakes that are occurring as a result of this collision course, 
the earthquakes are going to plot along the surface of the downgoing plate. And so these earthquakes are pretty deep, and they essentially outline the entire the surface of the downgoing plate as it goes into the mantle. And that's how we kind of draw these models as a result of co the collection of that data. Okay, so this is an example when you have ocean lithosphere colliding with continental lithosphere. Now, sometimes you can have ocean lithosphere colliding with ocean lithosphere. And what happens here is the denser slab is the one that's going to sink. And the reason why this one's denser is because this ocean crust is older. Uh, what happens to ocean crust when it's created at a mid-ocean ridge? It's very young and hot and buoyant. But as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridge, the further and further it goes, the older it gets. The older it gets, the colder that rock gets, and the heavier and denser it is. So when you have two ocean lithospheres colliding, uh, the older one was the one that will subduct into the asthenosphere. So this is case number one. This is case number two. Now, there's a scenario where you have continental lithosphere colliding with continental lithosphere. And when this happens, neither one of them subducts into the mantle because they're too buoyant. Okay, Buoyancy. Think of um, the asthenosphere as like water in a pool. And then if you have a boogie board right in the pool, it'll float to the top. The reason is is because that boogie board is less dense than the water that it's in. And as, m as hard as you try to push that boogie board under the water, it's still going to pop up and smack you in the face. <laughs> okay, So continental lithosphere is less dense than the asthenosphere, so it kind of floats above it. So when you have two continental kind of lithospheres colliding with one another, it's kind of like two cars crashing, uh, having like a head-to-head -head collision, and the hoods of the cars kind of crumple upwards. That's what creates mountain ranges. Okay, and that's what was so kind of transformative of this plate tectonics theory is that now with this theory of understanding um, that our Earth, surface of our Earth is divided up into these lithospheric plates, um, they're the cause uh, of mountain ranges. Like the reason why we have mountain ranges in places today is because of tectonic boundaries interacting with one another. And geologists have always wondered why are volcanoes located in the Pacific Northwest, right? There's Mount Shasta, Three Sisters, Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, okay? Why are there volcanoes? How come Florida doesn't have any volcanoes? And why are there volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest, the United States? Well, the reason is because of subduction. And the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath our American plate. And that subduction... When the ocean plate reaches a certain level into the stenospheric mantle, it induces melting. And then those melts rise up through the overriding plate, and they manifest as volcanoes on the surface. Okay, so we call this type of convergent plate boundary oceanic continental. So you have oceanic lithosphere colliding with continental lithosphere. The ocean lithosphere subducts, goes into the mantle, generates some melts, those rise up and form volcanoes, and you get what we call continental volcanic arcs. So this here is a continental volcanic arc in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington, and that produces very dangerous, explosive volcanic eruptions, like what occurred in the 80s with Mount St. Helens. Now you can have a scenario where two ocean plates collide. We call that oceanic-oceanic convergence. And so the denser ocean plate subducts, and you generate deep ocean trenches. Okay, so um, here, these are the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska. Here's that deep ocean trench. Okay, so the Pacific plate is subducting underneath this ocean plate here, and melts are being generated, and they kind of uh, make their way through the overriding ocean crust over here, and they show up as these beautiful volcanic island arc features just kind of rise up uh, from the uh, ocean floor to create these volcanic islands. And we call this an island arc. And then lastly, uh, how I mentioned how uh, mountains form, um, that's continental-continental convergence. Here there's no subduction because uh, both plates are too buoyant. Um, and you create really tall mountains. 
Himalayas are an example of this. And the, the, the coolest example um, of this occurring uh, are the majestic Himalayan mountains. Um, India was kind of its kind of own island continent out in the Indian Ocean. And about, I think it was 70 million years ago, began moving northward. And as it moved northward, it was on a collision course with Asia. Okay, and then when it slammed into Asia, boom, that uplifted all the kind of uh, continental rocks in both regions and created the Himalayan mountains as we know them today. And, and some, you know, some of the, uh, the rocks at the peak of the Himalayan mountains, like on Mount Everest, are limestones. Limestones form in shallow oceans. So these uh, sedimentary rocks have kind of been pushed all the way up to about 29,000 feet, which is incredible. Okay, the last type of uh, boundary is the transform boundary. Um, and this essentially is where two segments kind of slide past one another. Um, these are often found around mid-ocean ridges because they help uh, uh, mid-ocean ridge plate movement or accommodate that movement. Remember, mid-ocean ridges are or spreading centers are long Earth's curved surface, so they have to be offset every once in a while. Um, and so they generate uh, strong earthquakes, but the, the earthquakes are very shallow. Okay, uh, one cool example of a transform plate boundary on uh, continental crust is the San Andreas Fault. Okay, and that's in California. Here it is right here. The North American plate is moving this direction. The Pacific Plate is moving in that direction, and that generates earthquakes all along this transform fault. Um, most transform faults are found in the ocean. They help accommodate spreading centers uh, move, or, or plates associated with spreading centers move. Um, and then there are continental transform faults. Uh, there's one that kind of cut the, from the Caribbean Plate, cuts through Haiti, and goes through Guatemala. Um, uh, there's that one there, and then yeah, the San Andreas Fault. Here are the transform faults that you find uh, that help connect two different spreading centers. So if you notice here, this is a spreading center, then here's a transform fault, another spreading center, transform fault, spreading center, another transform fault. Okay, and then here's the San Andreas Fault, kind of cuts through uh, California and then goes in through the Gulf of California. And then this is a subduction zone. Here's the, uh, an ocean trench just to show you the deepest parts of our ocean. Uh, and that's because of this kind of ocean plates kind of buckling downwards and creates this kind of V-shaped trench, very deep area. Okay, um, there are some applications to uh, the theory of plate tectonics. Uh, one thing that has helped us understand are mantle plumes. Uh, mantle plumes are are these giant, bulbous, uh, anomalously hot areas of the mantle that rise. Okay, it's kind of like a giant diapir. Think of a lava lamp. I don't know if you've gone to your co college friend's dorm room and then seen him, hey, check this lava lamp out. And you can see these diapirs of oily material kind of moving upwards as the lamp heats up that material. That's what happens in the mantle very slowly, but uh, these uh, really hot portions of the mantle rise. And as they rise, they, they decompress and they start to melt. And then those melts make it through the overlying lithosphere uh, and generate what we call a hot spot. And that's where there's an enormous amount of volcanic activity. Huge volumes of, uh, of magma are generated and erupt uh, from massive volcanoes on the Earth's surface. Uh, they generate volcanic islands or island chains. Okay, um, and the reason why that's important is because they create uh, nematodes, and these are hotspot tracks essentially, and that records ancient plate motions. Okay, so here's the mantle diapir. Here it forms uh, a volcano on the ocean floor, which may rise up as a kind of volcanic island, kind of like the Hawaiian Islands. But as the the lithosphere continues to move and moves in this direction, the Mantle plume remains fixed, and then it basically just generates a new island, uh, and then these original volcanic islands move away from the hotspot and become inactive. So th there are many uh, hotspots, okay? There's one in Iceland, the Azores, 
uh, Galapagos, Easter Island is a hot spot. Okay, Hawaii is a hot spot. There's a lot of these uh, hot spots all over. Um, our Yellowstone, all right, National uh, Park here, that's a hot spot as well. So there's uh, increased activity due to ma mantle upwelling. And so what happens is if we look at Hawaii, uh, um, what we know is that uh, the, the current kind of big island of Hawaii, that's where we have uh, Mauna Loa and active volcanisms. We have Kilauea. Those are erupting today. Okay, so the big island is kind of above the mantle plume right now. Um, but uh, ahead of the big island of Hawaii, a lot of volcanism occur is occurring on the bottom of the ocean and kind of forming uh, another volcano underneath the ocean. It hasn't breached the surface of the ocean yet because not enough volcanism has erupted, not enough lava has erupted. But if you go away from the big island and start going to the other islands like Kauai, Oahu, or Molokai, if you compare the ages of the volcanic rocks, they get progressively older uh, the kind of more northwest you go. And so the, the rocks on Kauai, for example, are between 3.8 and 5.6 million years. In Oahu, they're slightly younger, 2.2 to 3.3. And then as you approach the big island of Hawaii, this is when they get the youngest. And so what that essentially means, if you look at this GIF here, um, this represents the lithospheric plate, and it's moving in that direction. And the hot, the mantle plume remains slightly fixed, and as it does so, as the plate moves, it just generates new and new islands every single time. And so if you if you map the ocean floor, what you notice is off of Kauai, since the, these are all, by the way, all these islands have no volcanic activity. It all has been extinct. And the reason why is because it's no, no longer above the mantle plume, because the Pacific plate has moved away from that mantle plume. And so those islands essentially uh, erode back into the ocean. And if you go off the coast of Kauai, what you'll find on the ocean floor are a bunch of seamounts. And seamounts are kind of relics of ancient Hawaiian uh, volcanic islands that have kind of eroded down uh, below the surface of the ocean. And you can follow those all the way to about this point here, and then it actually moves northward. So essentially, um, these seamounts, if you trace them out, it kind of records the direction of the Pacific Plate. So over the past 40 million years, the Pacific Plate has been moving in this direction. Then right around uh, this time, there was a shift in its direction and it moved northward. So the direction of plate movement can change over time. And um, the Hawaiian island Nematath helps record ancient plate movements. So there are other features on the ocean floor that are generated by uh, plate tectonics. One are seamounts. Seamounts are kind of um, uh, volcanic structures that don't breach uh, the surface of the ocean. So here's a mid-ocean ridge, right? So we have ocean lithosphere moving in this direction and in this direction. You have a bunch of uh, seamounts here, okay? This would be a volcanic island something like uh, like the Galapagos or Hawaii. Um, but volcanic islands, as the activity stops, um, then they start eroding away. And they can, uh, seamounts have rounded tops because they haven't eroded the kind of um, uh, tops of them yet. But a lot of these islands, what will happen is the ocean will basically just cut it off almost like a, like a tree stump. And then you'll get uh, table mounts or guyats. And these are volcanic features with flattened tops. And what that essentially means is that here they are, they're flattened tops. The wave action from the sea flattened these and eroded these and, and uh, kind of uh, made that erosional feature. So over time, um, as you move away from the mid-ocean ridge, there's a lot of crustal subsidence, meaning that the crust sinks because it gets cooler. Remember, it's really hot over here. There's a lot of volcanic activity, and that heat kind of pushes the crust upwards. So as time passes by and as the two plates move away from each other, this part of the ocean lithosphere, which was at a higher um, kind of uh, elevation from the sea floor, kind of sinks and subsides downward to deeper and deeper water. Okay. And this affects how uh, coral reefs can develop in the ocean 
uh, because of plate tectonics. Now there's there's three types. There are fringing reefs, which they develop along the margin of a landmass. So think of coral reefs that will form along the, uh, like the Keys, for example. There are barrier reefs, which are coral reefs that are separated um, uh, by lagoons, okay? And they can be kind of patchy. Um, and then there are atolls, and atolls are coral reefs that grow after volcanoes are submerged. So let's take a look at a picture of this, this um, process. So you can have all three reefs forming um, from one uh, active volcano kind of sprouting out from the ocean floor. So here's a cross-sectional view of a volcano, right? It rises up above the ocean floor. And what you have forming around the volcano would be a fringing coral reef, a barrier between a landmass and the ocean. But as time passes by, the activity from this volcano uh, wanes and goes away. It cools down, so it begins to subside, right? So the volcano kind of goes downwards. But uh, the coral reef community um, kind of builds on top of one another. They kind of built their quote-unquote apartment complexes on top of one another, so they kind of uh, grow upwards as the volcano is sinking and try to keep up, and then they create, the next step is a barrier reef. So that's what would form around a kind of extinct volcano and kind of subsiding, and kind of going downwards. Then over time, the volcano kind of completely submerges itself underneath the ocean, and then you get this kind of central lagoon, and then these coral reef islands will form around that central lagoon, and we call that an atoll, okay? And then that's where the coral, current coral reef uh, organisms will form within the lagoon and also on the fringe here. So, uh, yeah, plate tectonics also affects kind of uh, ocean communities. Um, what's also interesting is the Great Barrier Reef, okay, largest coral reef community on Earth, um, this habitat, uh, coral reefs only form in tropical waters because they need a, a heavy dose of warm waters that have very low nutrients, and that's where they can proliferate clear water so the sunlight can get through. Um, so they only occur at certain latitudes, kind of uh, north in the southern hemisphere, north towards the equator above the uh, Tropic of Capricorn. Okay. So this is where you would find the Great Barrier Reef. But what's happening is Australia, its plate movement is moving northward. So what's happening is, is just south of the, the, the Tropic of Capricorn, you don't find coral reefs down here. But because Australia is moving northward, new coral reef communities uh, are, would be colonating these areas as they approach more warmer waters as, as Australia moves northward. And if we look at the geologic past, this area right here, 10 million years ago, was down here, okay? And 20 million years ago, this part of northern Australia was actually found down here. And in 30 million years, uh, this is where it was located. So the great extent of the Great Barrier Reef kind of began 30 million years ago as Australia was way further south. So the Great Barrier Reef itself kind of records the plate movement in Australia. So ultimately what this has come down to uh, with a lot of geologists understanding that we're actually on these tectonic plates and land masses that are moving, you could use that to kind of reconstruct what the Earth looked like in the geologic past. And over time, uh, continents grow. They add uh, material to continental crust and they kind of grow over time as kind of um, uh, continental lithosphere kind of collides with one another. Um, and so Pangaea did exist, and Alfred Wegener was correct. Uh, 200 million years ago is when it began to break apart, but it existed for a while in geologic history. Okay, and then here, this is the reconstruction of what Earth used to look like in the past. This is where we are today, but if you go back 65 million years ago, this is what the Earth looked like, our best reconstruction. And if you go back 120 million years ago, you can see here, South America and Africa were still kind of connected. Here is the North Atlantic Ocean forming, okay? If you go back even further, 170 million years, here's the first kind of div 
uh, breaking up of North America and Africa, forming the Proto-Atlantic. Here's Pangaea. Okay, this is what Pangaea looked like 240 million years ago when dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. Okay, and then as we go further and further back, this is what uh, our Earth looked like about half a billion years ago. Our best reconstructions of it. So just to highlight it, 180 million years ago, Pangaea began to separate. North and South America rifted from Europe and Africa, forming the Atlantic Ocean Basin. So that's how oceans form, this process of uh, a divergent plate boundary forming on a continent. Um, 120 million years ago, South America and Afri Africa separated. 45 million years ago, India starts colliding with Asia, and that started the creation of the Himalayan Mountains, our youngest mountain chain on Earth. And Australia began moving north uh, from Antarctica and thus creating the Great Barrier Reef. So what's going to happen into the future? Well, if we assume the same direction and plate motions, the Atlantic Ocean will actually get bigger and the Pacific will shrink because Africa, Europe, South America, and North America are kind of moving away from each other and making the Atlantic even larger. A new narrow sea will form as East Africa continues to rift. We kind of talked about that. Uh, the Himalayan mountains will continue to get bigger. Okay, uh, North and South America, sadly, are going to split apart and they'll be isolated once more. Um, and part of California will move northward towards Alaska, and that's pretty crazy. So here's a world map uh, into the future. And again, this is assuming that plate motions don't change, but we know that they do because of those uh, island hotspot tracks. So assuming that happens, look at California. Maybe a, a narrow sea forms and splits uh, the Ameri uh, North America apart. Here is South America, perhaps connecting with Antarctic plate as this moves northward. Here's the East African rift, okay? And Australia continues to move northward and starts colliding with all land masses that are over here. So it's pretty crazy. This is 50 million years in the future.